March 8, 2021 Sarm Heslop 41-year-old female Sarm Heslop was last seen in St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands on March 8, 2021. The former flight attendant from Southampton, England, was last seen going to dinner with her boyfriend before heading back to the 47-foot luxury catamaran where the couple worked selling charter cruises and also lived on. A late-night alarm and a missing woman have led investigators to be reliant on the one man who claims to have been there, but has very little answers. Without eyewitnesses or forensic evidence, it's unknown if Sarm even made it back to the catamaran that night she was last seen, and if she did, what happened afterwards on board remains a mystery. Did she purposely escape, jump onto a neighboring boat, or did she fall victim to an accident or domestic violence? Or is her case another casualty of faulty police work and corrupted island officials? Former flight attendant Sarm Heslop always heard the call of the sea. In 2019, while in southern Spain, she fell in love with boats and sailed across the Atlantic with a few friends, arriving at the Caribbean island of Granada. It was there, in the summer of 2020, she met 44-year-old Ryan Bain and his 47-foot-long catamaran, the Siren Song. Bain had moved to the Caribbean from Michigan in 2015 after his divorce and had made a new life for himself as the captain and owner of the Siren Song, which he operated for rentals as a luxury charter boat while also living on board. A few months went by and Sarm decided in the fall of 2020 to leave Granada for Europe, but just a few months later, she would change her mind and return to the Caribbean this time to live and work with Bane on the Siren Song. The couple had only been living and working together a few weeks, when on Sunday, March 7th, they wrapped up a weekend charter job in the morning and were planning to spend the rest of the day relaxing. The boat was moored in shallow water, 50 yards offshore from Frank Bay and St. John. A group of people aboard another catamaran, just 100 feet away from the Siren Song, reported seeing the couple that Sunday this is a photo taken from that other boat showing the siren song as it appeared in the water that day. What happened that evening and the exact timeline of events is something that seems to have gotten murkier over time. A few major reasons for that is the lack of CCTV footage or credible eyewitnesses to corroborate the story and timeline, which so far has been told by Bain alone. What is known is that the couple went to dinner in St. John's that Sunday with loose reports that alcohol was involved, how much and by whom remains unclear. Bain then said the couple returned to the catamaran around 10 p.m. and went to sleep. The boat was still moored 50 yards off the beach and in the vicinity of several other boats, including the one with travelers who had seen the couple earlier. At 2 a.m., Bain claims he was awakened by the boat's anchor alarm, which becomes triggered if the boat drifts overnight. It is at this time Bain states he first noticed Sarm was no longer on board. According to Bain, he became concerned and called friends for advice, eventually contacting the island police around 2.30 a.m. Bain then rowed his dinghy ashore and made a statement with the police, but there was no search of the boat. The following morning, on Monday, March 8th, at his request, the Coast Guard searched Bain's boat, but didn't report anything of interest. Then the Coast Guard and local police launched an air and surface search of the shoreline, water, and surrounding islands, which continued well into the night. Sarm's belongings, including her cell phone, shoes, and purse, were all found on board the boat. Although it remains unclear if that's proof she returned to the boat, as these items could have been left on board all along, or even returned and placed there by someone else, or Bain himself. To explain Sarm's disappearance, the first set of theories revolve around the idea that Sarm did in fact return to the Siren Song that night after dinner. If she did return to the boat, where did she go? Did she fall overboard? Catch a ride on a passing boat, which according to locals often happened. Go for a late night swim. Did her and Bane have an argument and she left the boat intentionally to return to shore? It was later revealed that Bane had been jailed for 21 days in 2011 on a domestic violence charge against his ex-wife. A disturbing background which some fear may have resurfaced in the few weeks the couple were living 
and working together. In a small bay, water can carry sound very effectively, but yet no witnesses reported hearing the boat alarm or a woman in the water or seeing Sarm later that night. Unfortunately, after the restaurant sighting, there was no evidence to indicate Sarm ever returned to the siren song that Sunday night. If she didn't return to the boat and then disappear between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. the next morning, what did happen to her? While on shore, did Sarm encounter foul play after leaving the restaurant, or perhaps even left the restaurant with someone else? Or, as some have speculated based on differing accounts, that Bain and her had sailed somewhere else for a few hours that evening, to a more distant and remote location, a location she may not have returned from, possibly falling victim to an accident or being passed as human cargo to another waiting ship. Without a forensic search of the siren song, police remain unable to confirm if there are any additional clues which may be on board, anything that could perhaps give investigators and her family a clue as to what happened that Sunday. After several weeks of searching, with no signs of a body or any other clues to indicate what happened to Sarm, the VIPD announced that it was going to look into several unconfirmed sightings of Sarm on other islands, stating they believe she may have left St. John for St. Thomas. Although Sarm's lack of an ID, or any funds, and the publicity about the case make it difficult to believe she was traveling independently around the islands. As the year progressed, the case went cold, and Virgin Islands police did not search Bain's boat, and without any evidence against him, he was allowed to leave the area, which he did. Then in November 2021, reports surfaced in the media that Bain had been laying low in Granada, about 500 miles from the Virgin Islands, trying to sell the siren song, now rechristened Orion's Belt. News of Bain attempting to offload the siren song before a full forensic search of the boat could be completed brought renewed calls by Heslop's family and friends to have law enforcement intervene in the investigation before it's too late and the boat is sold and any evidence that may be there is lost forever. The VIPD continues to seek Bain's cooperation in its investigation, stating they need his voluntary involvement since he was the last known person to have contact with Sarm. But to date, Bain has not responded, apart from a letter written by his attorney. Sarm's parents have made several passionate pleas for both the British and US authorities to step up the investigation, but so far, the case remains unsolved. As of the making of this program, no warrant has been granted for a full forensic search of the siren song. And although he is a person of interest, Bain has not come forward to offer any further assistance. Sarm Heslop is 5 feet 8 inches tall, with long dark brown hair and a large, colorful tattoo on her shoulder of a seahorse, butterfly, and flower. If you have any information about the whereabouts of Sarm Heslop, or if you have seen or remember any detail which could aid investigators, please contact the Virgin Islands Criminal Investigation Bureau or Crime Stoppers U.S. Virgin Islands at 800-222-TIPS. August 2nd, 2011. Robin Gardner. 35-year-old female Robin Gardner was last seen in Orange Dot, Aruba on August 2nd, 2011. A weekend island getaway with a secret lover has led to a young woman's disappearance was the 35-year-old from Bethesda, Maryland, a victim of the ocean currents while on a snorkeling excursion, or was her traveling partner more involved in her disappearance than he is letting on? In July of 2011, recently unemployed Robin Gardner told her live-in boyfriend of two and a half years, Robert Forrester, that she'd be leaving town to visit family in Orlando, Florida for several days. On the day before she left, she told Robert she was in fact going to Aruba on a surprise trip from her parents. In reality, Robin would be flying to the South Caribbean island of Aruba with a man she had met through an online dating site a year and a half before. The man she was meeting was 50-year-old Baltimore businessman Gary Giordano. According to friends, the two had a rocky on-and-off-again relationship for the past year, sometimes not communicating for months. Robin and Giordano arrived in Aruba on July 31st 
and were staying at a resort and casino in Orangedad, which would be the location Robin was last seen at. On the afternoon of August 2nd, according to Giordano, the two had been out for a snorkeling excursion at Baby Beach, where the 50-year-old claims the last time he saw Robin was when he tapped her leg underwater, signaling her to return to shore. Giordano claims that when back on shore, Robin was nowhere to be seen, and he immediately feared a current or riptide had swept the young woman out to sea. Authorities were never able to confirm the snorkeling story, although Giordano claims to be a certified scuba diver, which makes Robin's disappearance while snorkeling even more puzzling. Gardner's family and boyfriend back in Maryland immediately cast out on the snorkeling story, claiming Gardner had no interest in snorkeling or swimming and was more of a margarita by the pool type of girl. Robin had communicated with her boyfriend in Maryland the entire time while she was in Aruba, with her last social media post at 2 a.m. on August 2nd, simply saying, this sucks. Was this an indication of trouble in paradise? Or had Robin discovered something about Giordano or Aruba that she hadn't known before? Robert said his last message from her was a text in which he claimed she said, I love you, we'll talk and sort things out when I get back. Giordano reported Robin missing to Aruban authorities around 6 p.m. that evening. Further confusing the timeline was a report of Robin leaving a restaurant around 4 p.m. that afternoon. Local authorities searched the area around Baby Beach, including with cadaver dogs, but there was no sign of Robin. A few days later, Giordano attempted to leave Aruba but was detained by authorities who wanted to pursue further questioning. Aruban authorities had also found out that only two days after Robin's disappearance, Giordano attempted to file a $1.5 million life insurance claim for a policy he had taken on Robin before their trip. The claim would be denied. The insurance company disputed his claim that they were partners, but he would go on to sue them for a payout, but the case was tossed, and it was Giordano who would eventually get sued by the insurance company for making a fraudulent claim. Giordano was held in Aruba until November of 2011, eventually being released due to a lack of evidence to charge him in Robin's disappearance. As the last known person to have seen Robin, Giordano became the subject of intense scrutiny, particularly his past with women. What emerged was a less than comforting story about the Baltimore businessman. This included numerous accounts from women who had dated Giordano in the past and who had filed restraining orders against him, accusing him of stalking and harassment. Initially, the search for Robin was being aided by the family of another woman who had gone missing in Aruba just six years before, Natalie Holloway. But the tip line the Holloways had helped set up ended up coming up empty. In 2014, someone investigating the Holloway case claimed to find bone fragments from a Caucasian female on the island. But after laboratory analysis, the bones were determined not to be from Holloway or Gardner. Giordano has always claimed Robin drowned that day while snorkeling, and that the remote beach the couple were at was also the site of two other drownings. Although the bodies of the two other drowning victims were recovered, Robin's never was. In 2014, Giordano released a book and went on several U.S. media outlets claiming he wanted to clear his name, but many critics accused him of exploiting Robin's disappearance. Among the many shocking new claims Giordano was now making, was an insinuation that Robin had worked as a call girl, although he made clear that she was not on the Aruba trip with him in that capacity, but rather just as friends. This allegation about Robin's past has not been confirmed. Did Robin drown while snorkeling on a secret getaway to Aruba? Or was she the victim of a predatory man set up in a scheme built to lure certain types of women to Aruba where they would be abducted by sex traffickers? This story was supported by a Pennsylvania woman who claimed Giordano had harassed her and her teenage daughter to go to the islands with him, but they had refused. This has led some to speculate Giordano was involved with traffickers and that Robin was just one of many women he had lured to the Caribbean with the promise of a free trip. Giordano later mentioned in an interview with ABC News that Robin may have been a victim of such a crime, although he still maintains his innocence and claims she was in fact a victim of the ocean and disappeared while snorkeling. Initially receiving a lot of media coverage, Robin's case has grown cold and updates have been few 
and far between. Although her family and former boyfriend remain hopeful she can be found alive and will return home, they continue to provide updates about Robin on their social media pages. Robin Gardner is 5 feet 4 inches tall, 115 pounds, with a tattoo on her left shoulder. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Robin Gardner, please contact the U.S. Consulate in Aruba or the FBI, where you can submit an anonymous tip online at tips.fbi.gov. September 18th, 2019, Lucy Schumann. 48-year-old female Lucy Schumann was last seen in St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands on Wednesday, September 18th, 2019. A hike through paradise that turned into a maze of unresolved questions. What happened to the solo traveler who vanished one afternoon, never returning to her vacation rental, leaving behind her belongings and a cryptic trail of clues with no answers? 48-year-old Lucy Schumann had a love for St. John's. She had been to the Caribbean island several times before and reportedly had many friends who lived there. So it was no surprise when the med student from Louisville, Kentucky, booked a trip alone in September 2019 to go to the island for some recreation and personal peace. Not much has been made about Lucy's private life. The majority of what is known has been provided by people who claim to be friends of hers from either medical school, her past as a pilot, or from St. John's. It didn't become known until later, but this trip to the island for Lucy was different than ones in the past. For starters, she wouldn't be staying for free with friends. Instead, she booked her own private accommodations, and she kept her arrival and travel plans private. It was later revealed she hadn't even told her friends that she was visiting the island. Nothing is known of Lucy's activities or the people she spoke with after her arrival up until Wednesday, September 18th, when Lucy left her vacation rental for a day of outdoor recreation and tropical beauty. The evidence suggests that she was planning on going for a hike in the Virgin Islands National Park around 8 a.m. that morning. That would be the last time anyone would see Lucy Schumann. Two days later, on Friday, September 20th, the owner of the Coral Bay vacation property that Lucy had rented called 911 around 6.30 in the evening. The owner had become alarmed when Lucy had not returned the keys and checked out his plan the day before, Thursday. They were also concerned she had left behind her belongings at the property, including her cell phone. It soon became known that on the 19th, Lucy had also failed to return a rented yellow Jeep Wrangler. As authorities began to search for Lucy, the first of many gaping holes in the case appeared. What had she been doing so far on this trip? Had she seen or met anyone? What was her mental state like? Was there security camera footage of her somewhere on the island? Unfortunately, there would be no answers for any of those questions. Investigators caught a break when the rented yellow Jeep Wrangler she had been driving was found in a parking lot in the Salt Pond area in the National Park. But there was nothing inside to indicate what may have happened to Lucy. While searching the park, investigators also found a day pack belonging to Lucy located near the edge of a cliff by the top of Ram Head Trail. The discovery of the day pack, with its change of clothes and her ID, would only lead to more questions. Did Lucy leave the day pack while on a hike, or was it placed there by someone else as a diversion? Had she been forced to leave it in a hurry, or had she fallen off the trail? According to hikers, the Ram Head Trail is popular with tourists and not described as particularly dangerous. And apart from exposing the hiker to a lot of sunlight, it is generally thought it would involve a great deal of effort to fall off or otherwise harm yourself while walking on it. In addition, Lucy was also a very experienced hiker and familiar with this trail, so a fall seems even less likely. The search continued as authorities, including Virgin Island National Guard, launched forays into other trails, beaches, and roadsides in the Salt Pond area. Unfortunately, the immediate search was stopped by poor weather from Tropical Storm Karen, which made the challenging terrain strewn with steep inclines and heavy vegetation even more difficult to search. But soon after the storm cleared, scuba divers, snorkelers, drones, search dogs, even professional rock climbers assisted in canvassing the various crevices and hidden nooks throughout the area. Several months later that fall, after logging over 2,000 search hours, the Park Service announced it would scale back the search for Lucy. 
Authorities made a note they would not speculate on what had happened to her, but would continue to follow leads wherever the case may go. With nothing to go on and very little information available, Lucy's case went cold. According to sources who claimed to know Lucy, she was a graduate of the University of Louisville Medical School. But in the spring before this trip, she had failed to place in a hospital internship while also doing poorly on a large exam, both of which led those who knew her to believe she may have been anxious and depressed about her future. But was she feeling bad enough to disappear forever? What her state of mind was like when she arrived in St. John's is unknown. Perhaps she was depressed, or she could simply have been looking for some alone time in a familiar place that she loved. There have been virtually no updates on this case, and so far Lucy's disappearance and the clues left behind have only created more questions for investigators. If Lucy was the victim of an accident while out exploring the park, many people think that her body or some clues of her clothing would have been found by now, but none has. Also, law enforcement mentioned early on they do not believe Lucy fell off the cliff while hiking. There also remain questions about the identities and involvement of the owner and employees of the rental property and the car rental place. What was their relationship with Lucy? Was she being followed or possibly extorted? Then there's the question if she was even on St. John's that day at all. Is it possible she went out boating with someone, took a ride in someone else's car, or took a swim, putting her into danger in the water? Given the small size and population of the island, many believe it would be difficult for her to remain undetected on land for long. Or is it possible that Lucy may have had other plans that she kept secret from everyone? Plans where she is alive and well, and living a new life somewhere else. Lucy's family has maintained their privacy and offered very little more than thank yous to those who have helped search for their daughter. Her friends and colleagues maintain a presence on social media where they share stories, check for updates, and offer support. Although authorities have not explicitly cited foul play in Lucy's case, it has not been ruled out. Lucy Schumann is 5 feet 8 inches tall, 130 pounds. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Lucy Schumann, please contact the National Park Service's Investigative Services Branch at 888-653-0009. March 24, 1998. Amy Lynn Bradley. 23-year-old female Amy Lynn Bradley was last seen on March 24, 1998 on the cruise ship Rhapsody of the Seas. A recent college graduate, Amy was on a Caribbean cruise with her father Ron, mother Iva, and brother Brad. Although Amy was a strong swimmer and lifeguard, she had been afraid to go on the cruise. In hindsight, Perhaps Amy had a premonition of the terror that would unfold as her family's dream vacation descended into a nightmare. To celebrate a generous work bonus, insurance executive Ron Bradley took his suburban Virginia family to San Juan, Puerto Rico for a Caribbean cruise. The Bradleys left San Juan Saturday, March 21st, on board Royal Caribbean's Rhapsody of the Seas, bound for Aruba. Having conquered her fear of cruising, Amy had adapted to life in the high seas and was having a great time. Amy also seemed to be making an impression on the ship's waitstaff, who mentioned to her family one night at dinner they'd like to take her on shore to Aruba. Amy would later say there was no way she'd go anywhere with them and that the waiters creeped her out. On Monday evening, March 23rd, the ship left Aruba for Curaçao, a Dutch island off the coast of South America. That last evening prior to her disappearance, Amy and her mother went to go look at the latest prints taken by the ship's photographers. What they found at the photo kiosk was chilling. All of Amy's photos were missing, but why and by who? The gallery operator recalled seeing Amy's pictures earlier, but had no explanation. Later that night after the Bradley parents were in bed, Amy and Brad headed out to the ship's disco for some fun. Coincidentally, a camera crew shooting a promotional video was filming that night and captured Amy on camera in what would be her final appearance. She is seen dancing with a man later identified as Alastair Douglas, aka Yellow, a member of a ship band named Blue Orchid. 
Yellow stated he left Amy at 1 a.m. to return to his crew quarters, a claim that was later confirmed by investigators. Amy and Brad returned to their cabin at 3.40 a.m. and hung out for a while on the balcony before Brad went to bed. Not feeling well, Amy slept on the balcony, where she was seen still resting by her father at 5.30 a.m. Around 6, Ron was awakened by a loud noise. He noticed Amy had left the balcony and the cabin, taking cigarettes and a lighter, but no shoes, indicating a quick trip back. When Amy didn't return, Ron's gut instincts leapt into action, and he began searching the ship. An hour later, a panicked Ron returned to the cabin and told his family that Amy was missing. With the entire ship about to debark onto Curacao, the Bradleys pled with the crew to wait until Amy could be located, but it proceeded as scheduled. The captain also denied the family's request to announce that Amy was missing or post photos, citing it would disturb the passengers. While the captain searched the ship, Amy's family spent all day scouring Curacao. Both efforts turned up empty-handed. As the ship's departure time approached, the Bradleys stayed on the island, praying for a miracle. The next day, the FBI contacted Ron, saying only the ship's common areas had been searched. Hopeful Amy may still be aboard, the Bradleys flew from Curacao to St. Martin and reboarded the Rhapsody. Disappointingly, both the ship and the FBI's investigation turned up nothing. For five days, the Dutch Antilles Coast Guard and a boat chartered by Royal Caribbean searched the waters where Amy was last seen. It was also in vain. Even interviews with crew members, including Yellow, the man seen with Amy in the video, turned up fruitless. After a polygraph test, the FBI released Yellow with no evidence to charge him in Amy's disappearance. Ron claims Yellow gave him and his friends a thumbs up after he passed the polygraph. In the absence of suspects in a body, the investigation would stall. But what did emerge were two compelling and disturbing theories on what happened to Amy Bradley. The first explanation for Amy's disappearance came from the cruise line who believed she had committed suicide. The Bradleys immediately dismissed the suggestions, citing how Amy had sent postcards, bought gifts for friends, and had a new job, apartment, and dog waiting for her back home. The idea that Amy had no reason to run away or injure herself was later supported by the FBI. With suicide taken off the table, the cruise ship and many investigators still believed it was very possible Amy had gone overboard, by accident or not. It's even been suggested Amy never made it out of the cabin, but fell overboard on her own balcony, making that noise which woke Ron up. For now though, we'll follow the official version that Amy left the cabin that morning, fully expecting to return. One highly plausible scenario is that while outside of the cabin, Amy either intentionally or unintentionally met up with someone and fell victim to an assault where she was accidentally injured or killed, with her body then being hidden or disposed of before the gang planks dropped. Supporters of the assault explanation believe the early hours, the impending debarkation, and the known occurrences of assault aboard cruise ships would make that morning a choice time for such a predatory act. It's also possible Amy left the cabin, went on deck to take pictures, didn't encounter anyone, and fell overboard alone somewhere else on the boat. There were several witnesses who stated they saw Amy that morning, along with Yellow, the musician, in an elevator and again on the top deck, where she was drinking a dark beverage he had brought for her. Amy's brother, Brad, recalled a comment from a crew member that day saying that he was sorry for what had happened to his sister. A weird comment considering no one at the time except Amy's family and the ship's senior staff knew she had vanished. For any missing persons case, the on-boat scenarios would be tragic enough. But this is where Amy's case gets seriously weird. And creepy. Since the beginning, Amy's family has believed she was taken off the Rhapsody and brought to Curacao against her will. They further suspect some members of the ship's crew had orchestrated the entire operation, which could explain why the captain and security dragged their feet on immediate searches 
and refused to wait that morning until Amy was found. It has been speculated Amy was separated from the passengers, possibly drugged, and smuggled out through a cargo exit hidden inside luggage, a laundry cart, or even on board a small boat. Supporting the abduction theory are a disturbing series of sightings which began soon after Amy's disappearance and continued for years after. In August of 1998, just five months after Amy was last seen, two Canadian tourists reported seeing a young woman with identical tattoos to Amy on a Curacao beach. The Canadians reported she was with several rough-looking men who they believed prevented her from speaking to them. Years later, the man recognized Amy from an episode of America's Most Wanted and contacted her family. He says he is haunted by the encounter and knows it was her. In 1999, a sailor from the U.S. Navy reported while at a brothel in Curacao, a young woman had come up to him and introduced herself as Amy Bradley. The woman said she was being held against her will and needed his help to escape. The sailor told her where the ship was docked, but he didn't tell authorities about Amy, fearing he would be disciplined for visiting a brothel. In 2002, after his retirement, the sailor reported the encounter, but by that time the brothel involved had been burnt to the ground. 2005, Barbados. While using a department store restroom, an American female tourist saw a young woman enter with three men who aggressively threatened her to not mess up a big deal that had been arranged. After the men left, the witness exited the stall to find the distraught woman hunched over the sink. The woman identified herself as Amy from Virginia. The sighting ended when the men re-entered the restroom and the witness ran out in fear. She reported the woman to authorities and this sketch was drawn. The latest and perhaps most disturbing clue of Amy's abduction came in 2005 when the Bradleys were emailed two photos found on a Caribbean sex tourism website. The photos are of an escort named Jazz. It is believed the woman in the pictures could be Amy. A facial recognition expert has examined the pictures and believes that Jazz is without question Amy Bradley. Doubters of the website photos question their authenticity. Could they be photoshopped fakes in some twisted prank? Also, are the photos too old to be Amy? The website credited photos as being from 1987 to 2003. The photos of Jazz appear to have hairstyles more typical of the late 80s and early 90s, setting it well before the time Amy disappeared. Also, none of her four tattoos are visible. The Southern Caribbean is a known hub for human trafficking and it is possible that Amy was victim to an inside job. But many criminal experts who have examined this case find abduction the least likely of the two disappearance theories. Furthermore, many experts believe an abduction would most likely happen while the victim was on the island, not from being smuggled off a cruise ship to the island, all while on a family vacation. None of the sightings have ever been confirmed as being Amy. Instead, they have become part of a succession of false starts bringing the Bradleys no closer to uncovering the truth about what happened to their daughter. Perhaps the greatest of these false hopes came in the fall of 1999 when the Bradleys were contacted by Frank Jones, a Florida-based private investigator and former Navy SEAL, who stated he had a team of ex-soldiers who could locate Amy and rescue her from Curacao. Working with tips from a hotel cook on the island, Jones claimed Amy had been seen shopping, riding in a car, and was being held captive by heavily armed Colombian gangsters. To complete the mission, Jones requested more money from the Bradleys, now totaling close to 200000 As the stories escalated and the Bradleys waited in Florida to pick up their daughter, a former Special Forces sniper hired by Jones realized the house he had been staking out, which Amy was allegedly held in, was bogus. The ex-soldier also realized other stories Jones had been telling the Bradleys were lies. He alerted the family, who in turn contacted authorities. Frank Jones, had fabricated the entire story, including being an ex-Navy SEAL. Jones was convicted and sentenced to jail for five years in order to pay back the money he stole from the Bradleys. Amy was declared deceased in 1999. In 2003, her parents brought a lawsuit against Royal Caribbean for negligence and wrongful death, but lost the case. They planned an appeal. It's been over 20 years since Amy Bradley was last seen and there's been no closure for her family. Did Amy ever make it off the Rhapsody of the Seas that morning? Or did she fall victim to foul play or an accident? 
or is her fate even more horrifying? Had Amy been set up and sold into human trafficking, forced to work in captivity, and moved around the Caribbean for years after, possibly even today? In 2018, 20 years after Amy was last seen, the FBI released these time-enhanced pictures of her. There remain three separate rewards for the return of Amy, information on her whereabouts, or any information at all leading to her recovery. If you have a tip on the fate of Amy Lynn Bradley, contact the FBI or American Consulate, or leave an anonymous tip at tips.fbi.gov.